So I was meeting the sandwich and got some pretty, pretty gnarly contact on my left side, especially from that Conquest car. That driver had something out for me for the first uh, seven corners for sure. Anderson, who's in the middle of that silver glass points lead. He was side by side into the braking zone. And Zach Anderson, it looked like, went for a bumpy ride. A little bit off track. Not sure how that's resolved itself. You can see him in the back of that picture dicing with Spirazzoli in the Conquest Mercedes, and it looks like for the moment that Anderson comes out on top in that scrap. But we fortunately made it unscathed. No, no punctures, no, no nothing. I, I did notice that the wheel was pulled to, down to the right a little bit, and I noticed that on the brakes, the car this, the front axle of the car would kind of sit in a weird way, and the car really didn't accept much trail brake. So went uh, and kind of cultivated my style as I was carving through the field. Unfortunately, in the middle of that, that climb, we got stuck behind Terry Borschler and the uh, Karis Callis Supra uh, and Kai Van Berlo and the uh, ACI Porsche. So those drivers, I was stuck behind them for way too many laps. just fast enough to to kind of keep me at bay and they raced me hard too like they did not give it up even though it was a pro am car and an am car and a silver car neither of us were actually racing so you know we're all racers out there so we have our instinct to compete with any cars around us but um, i don't understand why they were fighting me so so hard um i guess drivers like a buffer Running seventh now is Anderson. He's gotten around Borcheller, who is the leader in the AM class. Eventually made my way up from 14th, 14th to 6th overall. Be able to get in in about half a minute's time. All right, Zach, be prepared to box this lap. We're going to this lap. Timmy has got the job done again, got the point, got the lead. Not blowing the competition away. He's got a 1.2 second lead over Kenton Cook, so Hanley's going to have to go up against Kevin Bowen and Jesse Webb. Anderson inside of Van Burlo. Oh, they didn't leave each other much room. Oh, good though. Uh, 
copy, sit link. Coming to the box, pit board is out. Reminder to turn the engine off. Turn the engine off and hit the box. No fuel goes on board, no tire changes to driver change. Minimum stop time is 84 seconds for GT4 competition here this weekend. Fire the engine. All right, make sure we're in gear. Make sure we're in gear. A couple other cars had their own fights to fight, and unfortunately that cost us some very precious track position early in the race. Sack did a very good job maintaining, uh, getting by and creating a uh, a lot of advantage for me when I got in, but I still got in the car about 11 seconds this back from the overall leaders. I dug deep, gave it everything I had there with about 10 minutes to go. I went to the pressure and had a shooting pain up my back. Immediately had to let go of the brake pressure, but uh, I think a little bit of it was fatiguing me and maybe it cost me a little bit of my outright pace. So I feel a little bit bad that I might've let my teammate down there. Then we drop back to Jason Bell, who leads the way in Pro-Am. Keep an eye on this car, John Capestro Dubet's fourth in silver, trying to reel in the top three. He gained 1.4 on that lap, 1.4 seconds that lap, 20 minutes to go. I did what I could. I got stuck behind that super for too long. Move the wheel down, but as long as he's working the string, like he's not carrying too much trail brake, the car works really good. A little advice from Zach to not carry too much trail brake, and the car worked pretty good. He said he got slightly tapped at the start, so the wheels were getting down. Stanley made a big mistake last five and does over a second on him. So the 999 may be coming to pit lane for a drive-through penalty. Be aware, 999 might be stuck in the pit lane. Uh, this is a big development. We've got a whole host of drive-through penalties for pit lane speed infractions. One of the cars involved is the number 999 of Dan Handley, who runs third overall right now. That's big for John Capestro Dubet, not so much for John, but his teammates, Zach Anderson. But let's think about what this penalty does. It drops, or it will, drop Hanley out of the third spot that will advance this 51 car up to third. Points difference from fourth to third is not huge, but it's not insignificant. And that then means that Jesse Webb and Mackay Stevens are that little bit further away heading to Indianapolis in a couple weeks. <laughs> but you gotta talk to, I was just starting to kind of figure it out. Does Dubetz know about this penalty? Well, you would assume that the team would be on top of that. That's the information you need in terms of risk versus reward. Here comes, answer the question anyway, Hanley out of the way and hits pit lane. Here it goes, go get him! Yeah, we got it. Penalty. Put it all in perspective, it's a 37 point lead for Zach Anderson, John Capestro, the best teammate coming into this race. As they sit right now, he'd lose 10 of that with Webb leading this race, team with Mackay Stevens. Jesse Webb and Conquest Racing out of the final turn for the final time. They'll take the checkered flag first and head to Indianapolis with a shot at the championship. Checkered flag is out, checkered flag is out. P3, buddy, P3, good podium run. Sandwiched so hard at the start. See your wheel damage. Just couldn't sustain the pace. Yep. That guy had to work. Well, it's the whole equation that we've been dealing with. Like, we've got pace in eclectic, but we can't hold on to it for the entire lap. There you go, brother. Ah, you did. You did awesome. Did what you did. Move forward. We leave the weekend with a net positive plus two point advantage for my championship lead against the Conquest Mercedes. Two top two overalls and one top three. Pretty good championship weekend.
I truly self-medicate with working out. It's, it is my daily dopamine drop, whether that be stretching or lifting or cardio or uh, whatever. And then I'll try and challenge myself to balancing and drumming and disconnecting my limbs and um, just connecting deeply to my body because I've been on the full side of the spectrum with health. I've always been pretty obsessed with working out. It's, it's, uh, it's part of my daily routine. I wake up and I, uh, I go and connect with my body. In a race car, it, like I am the antenna and I, I am the receiver of information and that information comes to me and flows into the car. So like the more, the more uh, switched on I am with my body and the more aware I am with where my hands are relative to where my feet are and eyes and all of these relationships, the better I, I am as a racing driver. So the better I feel mentally going in as well. If I don't work out for a couple days, I start to start to get low. <laughs> it's truly my, uh, it fills my cup up in a big way. I try to challenge myself with stress exposure by uh, training at the peak hot hours of the day and then jumping into a cold plunge. The colder, the better. That's a, that's a dopamine release, long and, and uh, continuous, much, much better than other dopamine releasing agents or drugs or anything like that. The sim, when you get into it, and I have a habit of getting into it pretty quickly in the day after my workout, I'll, I'll typically do a sim, sim session. I think that we're living in miraculous times. Um, to, I think back to my childhood and I think m the kid version of me and my past self would look at, look at that simulator room and the jaw would hit the floor. I think it's amazing that we can immerse ourselves in this like photorealistic reality where we get to compete and where we get to, to, to put ourselves through identical situations um, but with a reset button. Um, so we can, we can allow ourselves to fail, we can allow ourselves to develop the technique. Whenever most new people get on a sim, their first comment is, this isn't anything like what I do. <laughs> And that's, that, that goes into, like, it is a skill, I mean, just like driving. And you've taken away all of the feeling, so you're basing the feeling off of pure vision, right? And the biggest benefit that simulating gives you is your eyes give your feeling much faster than your body feels the feelings and then has to send it up to the brain and then think about what you're feeling and then execute on that feeling. You know, seeing the horizon shift and developing a sense of yaw while you're standing still, but because the, the, the horizon is shifting, you feel the car doing these things and you don't need to be moving to feel it. You just need to have your eyes downrange. Pre-race weekend starts the moment I get home from the previous race. So if that's eight weeks, then whatever's next on the calendar is what's loaded up onto iRacing or a set of course of competition or whatever. I like to show up to any any track with at least 500 laps or so around around the circuit. I won't guarantee anything other than the rhythm can be quickly established. I will roll out of the pits and I know exactly kind of the timing of everything. When you've lapped a circuit consistently for that amount of laps, you know when your lap is half a second off relative to what you're capable of. If you are able to, it is, uh, it is the biggest gift a driver can have, really. In my opinion, eliminating all the feeling and then forcing the feeling to come through your eyes. That's what simulation gives you.